blessings in Jesus, dear friends. And, of course, we remain in the world of the lockdown and the controversy surrounding it. I'd like to look at a very important subject out of necessity this week, not something I really wanted to speak about or concerning, but basically we've been forced to because of some of the things that are going on. I would describe some of these things as shameful and dishonest antics by people who should and do know better. Nonetheless, this is the time in which we live, an age of apostasy. You know, we've warned many times, many, many times, that the overriding sign of the return of Christ was and will be perpetration of deception against the elect. Wars, yes. Rumors of wars, yes. Famines, yes. Pestilence, yes. Earthquakes, yes. Seismic activity. Events of the Middle East, Jerusalem being restored. All of these things, and as in Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem being trampled by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. All of these things are signs of the return of Christ and more, many more. We know this. We know that the stage is being set for Antichrist as we speak. Even things like coronavirus, events in the Middle East, Brexit, and so forth, all of these things, as we've been saying consistently, have prophetic significance. Right now, the Holy Spirit, of course, as we've always pointed out, is trying to prepare or is preparing the faithful bride for the return of Christ. The Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful bride for the coming of the bridegroom that we read about in the book of Revelation and Matthew 25 and the Song of Solomon by poetic allegory and so forth. The return of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is something called a shoshpan, shoshpan, preparing the bride for the coming of the bridegroom. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. At the same time, the spirit of Antichrist, as the apostles define it, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the world and the apostate church for the coming of the man of lawlessness, the anthropon enomon, the Antichrist, complete with the mark of the beast, complete with the abomination of desolation, it's all being set up. The Holy Spirit is preparing for the coming of Christ. The spirit of Antichrist is preparing for the spirit of Antichrist. However, key to the strategy of Antichrist is deception of the elect. Now, we've talked many times also about 2 Peter chapter 2, the way false teachers and false prophets operate the way they attempt to deceive the elect, or the way Satan attempts to deceive the elect through them. It's called parasogzusin. They put truth next to error. People who say many good and many true things, but they introduce a deadly poison into the mixture. Again, a three-egg omelet. Two is good, one egg is rotten or a couple of drops of arsenic in a glass of milk. Well, most of it's good, but the arsenic is still adequate to kill. This is the reality. Parasogzusin. They disguise error with truth. They place truth next to error. They say many good things. A little leaven leavens the entire lump. Now, we're not talking about important yet non-fundamental issues. There's controversy surrounding the timing of the rapture and the parousia. Godly people disagree on pre-trib, pre-wrath, mid-trib, post-trib, important issues. But it does not make the brethren who believe one particular point of view heretics. They may be mistaken, but doesn't make them heretics. Important issues, yes, but not things we should divide over. They're important issues for prayerful discussion. Things like this, amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial. 
Now, as you know, I am of the view that the rapture will not happen until the faithful Christians know who the Antichrist is. I take the scriptures literally. And I am of the view that there will be a millennial reign of Christ. I'm premillennial. But I know people who love the Lord who have different views. I think they're mistaken, but they're my brethren. I'll discuss. But what is something fundamental, something deadly, we have a problem. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. They may be 90% right, but that 10% arsenic will kill. One example of this is how Antichrist is attempting to deceive the elect. It is obvious that the word faith money preachers, people like Benny Hinn, who I once confronted as a false prophet making false predictions, I confronted him eyeball to eyeball in Hawaii, or people like Kenneth Copeland, or people like Mike Bickle. These people have made major false predictions in the name of the Lord. According to the book of Deuteronomy and other scriptures, they are by scriptural definition proven false prophets. Those who follow such people are in rebellion against the Lord, and they are being set up for the false prophet who will ultimately point people to Antichrist. This is very serious. Very serious. This is the work of Antichrist. Well, but it's obvious, at least obvious to a discerning and biblically knowledgeable Christian, that Satan is using these false prophets of the word faith. It should be obvious that he's using the false prophets of the New Apostolic Reformation and its adjuncts. The mysticism and Gnosticism of, of Redding, California with Bill Johnson. This is setting the stage for Antichrist, undoubtedly. The ecumenical movement is setting the stage for Antichrist. The facts are there. The interfaith movement are setting the stage for Antichrist. All of these things. However, what happens when someone who appears to be orthodox from our own ranks becomes an agent of Antichrist. Remember, the Antichrist is the son of perdition. Judas is the son of perdition. When we see something about Judas, the Holy Spirit is teaching us something about the Antichrist to come. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Nobody except Jesus knew who he was. No one had any idea he camouflaged his agenda too well. He seemed to be too much one of them, too orthodox to be the one who was the son of perdition. Well, it's the same strategy happening today. Jesus said there will be many antichrists before the ultimate one. That's part of the problem. There'll be so many when the ultimate one shows up, people will at best think he's just another one, and they won't even recognize him as that initially. Satan is setting the stage, preparing the trap. But let's look at this now very carefully. Lord, is it I, if possible, the elect will be deceived. Satan must get into the camp. Who better to do it? Who better to set the stage for Antichrist among sincere, Bible-believing, otherwise discerning Christians? If possible, the elect will be deceived. Who better to do it than people who outwardly, outwardly, appear to be the diametric opposite of false prophets and false teachers? I speak of the reformed cessationist camp. I'm only stating facts, I'm not attacking, I'm stating documented facts. At Liberty University, making itself the East Coast mainstay of evangelical higher education, Jerry Falwell, the late Jerry Falwell. The Korean cult leader, Sun Young Moon, wrote a book called The Divine Principle. I know Christians who were saved out of his cult, the Unification Church. 
Sun Young Moon said his wife was the Holy Spirit. That was his teaching. And that he was the Lord of the Second Advent, the return of Christ. In his book, The Divine Principle, he said Jesus failed in his first coming, so Moon is going to succeed where Jesus failed in the second coming. He's the Lord of the Second Advent. He claimed to be the return of Jesus Christ and his wife, the Holy Spirit. How much of an overt, incontestable antichrist can you get than the late Sun Young Moon, who was also a criminally convicted swindler sent to federal prison? How much more overt of an antichrist can you get than someone who comes physically and literally says he's the return of Christ? You can't. He identified himself as the Lord of the Second Advent and his wife as the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine Jerry Falwell bringing him on the stage at the Liberty University Assembly with all their professors there singing the praises of Moon as an unsung hero after Moon made a contribution of a couple of million dollars? An unsung hero, a proven antichrist, yet a fundamentalist, cessationist, supposedly doctrinally conservative Baptist, sang the praises of a self-admitted antichrist. That literally happened. And those professors at Liberty University those pre-trib people like Ed Hinson said and did nothing. Outrageous. How can a fundamentalist do this? A reformed Baptist do this? But they did it. They did it. Now we have J.D. Greer the recent president of the Southern Baptist Convention in America, stating that born-again Baptists should be the number one spokesman for homosexual and lesbian rights. This is a Southern Baptist. Well, it's frightening. It's frightening that people claiming to be of a fundamentalist persuasion. These are people who say they're reformed. I'm not reformed, but they say they are, Calvinist. People who are cessationists. I'm not a radical cessationist, I'm a moderate, but they are cessationists. How could they do this? I'd like to read from the book of Revelation, chapter 14. Verse 11, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And now tau and yaunes, from age to ages, the Greek translation of the Hebrew olame olamim. In other words, for eternity. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Whoever. No exceptions. There's no exception clause. If there was some theoretical possibility of them repenting, it's irrelevant. They're not going to do so. When Jesus dipped the sop, Judas, at the Last Supper, had the theoretical possibility of repenting. But he was the son of perdition. Jesus said he lost not one except the son of perdition. The son of man must be betrayed but woe by him by whom he is betrayed. There was no way. He made his choice, but it happened. I read in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw the thrones, and they sat upon them. Judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus. And because of the word of God, 
and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark upon their forehead and upon their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. Notice it is only the ones, only the ones who did not take the mark of the beast, who came to life and reigned with Christ, who had not worshipped the Antichrist. The other ones did not come to life until the thousand years were over not to the resurrection of the unrighteous at the end of the millennium. They're not part of the resurrection of the righteous. They're not saved. No exception clause. Now, a diverting argument, well, it's not the unforgivable sin. Judas didn't commit the unforgivable sin. He didn't blaspheme the Holy Spirit, but he didn't repent either, and either will these people. We are told directly, emphatically, whoever takes the mark of the beast, the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. We are told emphatically that those who take the mark of the beast will not be in the resurrection of the righteous. They will not be resurrected until the end of the millennium for judgment, for sentencing. That's what it says. That's exactly what it says. That is what Christians have always believed in orthodox eschatology. They've always believed that. Now you have John MacArthur. Of all people, John MacArthur teaching it will be possible to take the mark of the beast, sell your soul to Satan, worship the Antichrist, follow the false prophet, and still repent and be saved and be born again. Where does he get that? He directly contradicts the word of God. He rejects what it says. He dismisses emphatically what it states emphatically. And then when cornered by his own words, he attempts to divert the conversation by saying it's not the unpardonable sin. It doesn't matter. They're not going to repent. There's no repentance for those people. It's not going to happen. They're not going to be resurrected. They're not among the righteous. The smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. Don't take that mark. Oh, but John MacArthur said it's all right. Well, he didn't say it's all right, but he says there's going to be people who can do it and still be saved. No. John MacArthur has become a voice motivated not by the spirit of Jesus, but in this case, at least, by the spirit of Antichrist. He's being used by Satan to prepare for the coming of the Antichrist, just like Jerry Falwell. No Christ, no peace. Not until Jesus reigns on the throne of David will there be global peace. There'll be peace in the hearts of true believers, but peace on earth, not until he returns. The Antichrist and the false prophet will attempt to engineer a false peace, particularly in the Middle East. But it will not be a true peace. The Antichrist comes on a white horse in Revelation 6, imitating Christ in Revelation 19, but he brings war instead of peace. There'll be a false peace. We read about this in the book of Daniel and so forth. There'll be a false peace. What the Antichrist and false prophet will do under the auspices of the false prophet, he will unite the world's false religious systems. He will unite those who worship other gods. He'll unite counterfeit Christianity. He will deceive those who believe in rabbinism, the false Judaism of the rabbis that rejects its Messiah. It's not true Judaism any more than the World Council of Churches or the Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy or true Christianity. They are not. They are Christendom. Judaism is rabbinism. The real Judeo-Christian faith are those who are born of the Spirit and who remain faithful to Jesus on the basis of Scripture. 
But the Antichrist is going to come, and the stage will be set not only in the political realm, not only in the economic realm, but in the religious realm. Fundamentalist, fundamentalist evangelicals have been preaching this for over a hundred years. Other gods are demons, says Moses. Shedim in Hebrew. Other gods are demons, says Paul in Corinthians. The Manoi, they're worshiping demons. When you see people worshiping other gods, they're worshiping demons. On his website, Rick Warren's Global Peace Plan, he says, we must unite, we must unite with people who worship other gods and have other religions, even though we don't agree with them, in order to bring in global peace. Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Mormons, it doesn't matter, teaches Rick Warren. It's on his website. The P is the anachronism for peace partnering with other religions. Would a partner with demon worshipers, with cults, with false religions that lead people to hell in order to bring in a global peace? No, this is the agenda of the Antichrist, the false peace he will bring by political, economic, and religious means. It is not the true peace of Jesus. It is the counterfeit riding the white horse of Revelation 6. It is not the true Christ of Revelation 19 on the white horse. Yet Rick Warren teaches this. He actively teaches this antichrist agenda, this agenda of the false prophet. He teaches it. It is antichrist. It is indefensibly antichrist. Yet we have John MacArthur's syncophant, Todd Friel, on his videos defending Rick Warren, defending a false prophet who is pushing the Antichrist agenda of false spiritual unity to bring in a counterfeit peace. Todd Friel defends this. Another fundamentalist. Reform cessationist. What do you do with people like John Piper? Go on YouTube and watch for yourself. John Piper on a platform standing with Beth Moore, the hyper charismatic, I would say hyper charismatic lunatic fringe false teacher. They were leading thousands of people in the Lectio Divina, New Age visualization. What's he doing with a woman like that? But there he was, straight from the lunatic fringe, there's John Piper, who's also someone who subscribes to the errors of replacement theology, supersessionism. John Piper, Todd Friel, John MacArthur and his syncophants like Phil Johnson and Chris Rossbro and Justin Peters, Jerry Falwell and the faculty at Liberty. What's going on? These are fundamentalists. Where are the Southern Baptist clergy reacting to what J.D. Greer did and said? Where are they? Oh, they say a lot of good things. Of course they do. Camouflage. Parasoxusin. They put truth next to error, but it's a little leaven that leavens the whole lump. It's to get the poison in. You sugarcoat the toxin. MacArthur does this. I've offered to debate him publicly on front of a live stream camera. He's defended vociferously by his sycophants. It's got to the point where Chris Rossbro has done the same thing as has Justin Peters. I've watched the videos myself. They're still on um, Facebook. 
I watched a clip last night on Facebook. You'll see Chris Rossborough with this woman who claimed, and, and, and Justin Peters, who claims that she saw a three-dimensional six-foot Jesus who then becomes huge in another version of the vision. And he has curly brown hair, and she describes him to an artist who paints the picture, but the stigmata, the pierce marks, are missing. We know in his resurrection the pierce marks were there from the Gospels and in Revelation. This is a different Jesus. Apparently, it's some kind of whatever it is. She claims to have had this vision <clears throat> in 2017, in January or something, and I am told has secured a book deal with the major American publisher, Thomas Nelson or something like this, based on this testimony. Well, when called out and challenged, they went frantic. They began attacking the person who pointed it out. Even though it was unrefuted, could not be refuted or denied. Just like John Piper leading the Lectio Divina with Beth Moore. These people align themselves with this woman. Now she's saying, oh, it might have been of the devil. As of last week, she changed the story and says, oh, it might have been of the devil. A counterfeit of the devil caused her to come to faith in Christ? Or she tried to say this was from before she was a Christian. That's not what she was saying a few weeks ago. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. So it's on Facebook. It's unbelievable. See Chris Rosbro sitting there with this woman saying these things? And then he gets angry when someone points it out, saying that it's MacArthur derangement syndrome and that the person who pointed it out is like the Adam Schiff of discernments. Wait a minute. I personally voted for President Trump, and I pray for him daily. I prayed for him today. Is he perfect? No, but I believe he's the man God has at this present time, and he needs our prayers, and I pray for him. There was no Russian collusion. It was all lies. It was a complete lie. There was no collusion. It was invented by his political enemies who lied with the assistance of the mainstream media. Adam Schiff is a deceiver. That's obvious. It was not true what they said about him. But it's very true what was said about John Magatha. You can watch him saying it for yourself. You don't need a smoking gun. You've got the gun in his hand. If they attack the person for telling the truth. This reminds me of the Sadducees and Pharisees. They hated each other. And the Pharisees hated the Romans. But they teamed up with people who they detested against Jesus. They make alliances with people they otherwise hate against the Lord Jesus. How people like Justin Peters, apparently, certainly Phil Johnson and Chris Rosborough, they seem to love John MacArthur more than they love Jesus Christ. They take his word and defend his word above what Jesus said. God has magnified his word above his name. Don't take my word for these things. Watch it. It's, unref un it's irrefutable. It's undeniable. This is the spirit of Antichrist trying to deceive the elect. The Antichrist is coming. Yes, the world's being deceived through its banking system and blockchains and pestilences. But Satan is trying to deceive the elect. And he's using these reformed, fundamentalist, Calvinist cessationists to do it. Of course, Satan is using the word faith money preachers and the hyper charismatics and ultra Pentecostals, but he's always used them. They're obvious. At least they are to most of the people who follow our ministry. But we're talking here about people you wouldn't expect. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I?
they are the ones you have to watch out for. And now they are showing their true hand. They're revealing their true cards. Watch what they say. Watch what they are doing. This is Antichrist. Todd Friel defends Warren's agenda. Defended it! Phil Johnson defends John McLaughlin. The clergy at liberty went along with Jerry Falwell. And it's open Antichrist. Open. Nonetheless, it's happening. It's frightening. It is indeed frightening. What this woman is going to do if she has submitted a manuscript claiming to have this vision that caused her to come to faith, now she's saying the vision is from the devil, or may have been from the devil, after she may have even gotten a cash advance. I don't know. That's not my problem, not my business. But it does not sound like an episode with much virtue in it. Let's move on. Let's understand damage and cover-up. Damage and cover-up. Turn with me, please, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 13. So we have Antichrist. Now let's look at cover-up, damage control, what false teachers and false prophets do when they get nailed. I've seen Mike Bickle pull this kind of stunt. I've seen the Kansas City prophets and their defenders pull this stunt. Now I'm watching people like the MacArthur fan club pull this stunt. Then the word of the Lord came to me in Ezekiel 13, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy from their own inspiration, listen to the word of the Lord, from their own inspiration. It's not necessarily demonic, although Satan has a hand in it. It's from the futility and imagination of their own carnal, pride-driven mind, as Ezekiel puts it, but as Jeremiah 23 explains it and elucidates it. Thus says the Lord God, woe to the foolish prophets who are following their own spirit, and they've seen nothing. They've seen nothing. A three-dimensional Jesus minus pierced marks of the nails with curly brown hair? Oh, Israel, your prophets have been like foxes among ruins. I'm not mentioning this woman's name or her book or anything. If you're interested, go on Facebook and see for yourself. It's not something I'm getting caught up in. You've not gone up into the breaches, nor did you build the wall around the house of Israel to stand in the battle on the day of the Lord. When you see that term, the day of the Lord, that tells us that the prophet is not prophesying for his own time which was the onset of the Babylonian captivity, circa 585 BC. It tells you he's also prophesying for the close of the age as we approach the day of the Lord. They see falsehood and lying divination who are saying the Lord declares when the Lord has not sent them. Yet they hope for the fulfillment of their word. They hope it happens. I told Benny Hinn, I've got a list of prophecies this long, predictions you made in the name of the Lord that didn't happen. You're a false prophet. He didn't want to deal with me. That was in Maui. Mike Bickle did the same thing in August of 1990 in the United Kingdom when he came with the Kansas City false prophets and the late John Wimber. Did you not see a false vision and speak a lying divination? 
when you said the Lord declares? But it's not I who've spoken. That wasn't Jesus. Coming three-dimensionally? Jesus says he's not coming back three-dimensionally, that is physically, except the way he left. He'll return to the Mount of Olives, but if anybody says he's come back physically, don't believe them. He's in the wilderness, don't go there. He's in the inner rooms, don't go there. Roman Catholic transubstantiation says in the Mass is a literal physical return of Jesus. That's not Jesus. It's a false Christ. The Eucharistic Christ of Rome is not him. He does not come back physically. Where Paul saw Christ or was taken up in 2 Corinthians or where John was taken up in Revelation, notice they had to come up to see the vision. And his hair was wool, white, and he was pierced. It was not brown and curly with no nail marks. And he was not three-dimensional. They were transfigured. When he comes back three-dimensionally, every eye will see. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you've spoken falsehood and seen a lie, therefore, behold, I'm against you, declares the Lord. The Lord is against you. Jesus Christ is your enemy because you have made him your enemy. Jesus Christ is your enemy. I'm against you. So my hand will be against the prophets who've seen false visions and utter lying divinations. They'll have no place in my council of my people nor will they be written down in the register of the house of Israel. Is that alluding to the Lamb's Book of Life? Or figurative of it? Nor will they enter the land of Israel, that you may know that I am of the Lord. Yes, it is talking about the predicted restoration from Babylon. But again, it prefigures, it foreshadows the day of the Lord, Ezekiel tells us. What is coming and what's coming quickly. It is definitely because they have misled my people, saying peace when there is no peace. And when anyone builds a wall, behold, they plaster it over with whitewash. We see this in the epistles. When men say peace and safety, then the end will come. We see this in Jeremiah. They say peace, peace, when there is no peace. And here we see it in Ezekiel. Rick Warren's global peace plan. We can unite with Hindus, Muslims, Mormons, and bring in global peace. No, you will bring in Antichrist. It is only Christ who brings global peace. They say peace, peace, when there is no peace. This is sold to evangelicals as Rick Warren's peace plan. And who defends him? Again, John MacArthur's lapdog, Todd Friel. There's no peace. If Todd Friel was of the Lord, he'd be warning against Rick Warren and his global peace plan. And he'd warn against... John MacArthur's teaching on the mark of the beast. So tell those who plaster it over with whitewash that it will fall. A flooding rain will come, and you, all hailstones, will fall, and a violent wind will break out. A spiritual attack will come. They tried to whitewash over it. In the last week to 10 days, I have watched Justin Peters, Chris Rossboro, do somersaults to whitewash over what they were party to, these false visions. Behold, when the wall has fallen, will you not be asked, 
Where is the plaster? Which you plastered it? You can attempt your damage control, but it won't work. Everything is video document documented. There's a pending book deal with this stuff in it, apparently. What's the publisher going to think? I don't know, and I don't care. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I'll make a violent wind break out of my wrath. There will also be in my anger a flooding rain and a hailstone to consume it in wrath. The Lord is angry and he is going to act. So I shall tear down the wall which you plastered over with whitewash and bring it down to the ground so that its foundation is laid bare. And when it fails, you will be consumed in its midst and you will know that I am the Lord. The hour of reckoning for those who whitewash over these deceptions is coming. You can't promote somebody who has false prophetic visions and then try to weasel your way out of it and whitewash over it and plaster over it and then attack those who tell the truth. Along with the prophets of Israel who prophesied to Jerusalem, who see visions of peace for her when there is no peace. No, Rick Warren's peace plan will not bring peace to Jerusalem or to anywhere else, Todd Friel. Why are you defending that deceiver, that servant of Antichrist? Now you, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who are prophesying from their own inspiration, prophesy against them. Women who prophesy from their own emotional temperament and then present it with female manipulation, it says. Thus says the Lord God, woe to the women who sew magic bands on all wrists and make veils for their heads of persons of every stature to hunt down lives. Will you hunt down the lives of my people, but preserve the lives of others for yourselves? Notice what these wristbands are. Magic bands, occult objects, things like tarot cards, or so-called angel cards, a pseudo-Christian version of the same thing. It works by divination, by what we call in Hebrew avot, familiar spirits, like the witch of Endor. These women who practice a cult. Now they tried to Judaize it, and today they may try to Christianize it, but it's a cult. And for handfuls of barley and of bread, you have profaned me to my people. Notice they are motivated by personal profit. They are motivated by a drive for some personal gain. Ezekiel says, you profane me to my people to put to death some who should not die and keep others alive who should not live. by your lying to my people who listen to lies. Those who are paying attention to those who are orchestrating and perpetrating the whitewash and the cover-up are listening to lies. There are those who should die they're allowing to live, though I don't mean in the new covenant we kill them physically as they would have been executed in the old covenant, but we take the sword to them. This is the sword. People like MacArthur need to be confronted. People like Todd Friel, Rick Warren, J.D. Greer, John Piper need to be confronted. But instead, it's those who confront them, who they want to kill, to let the wicked continue and the righteous fall victim. 
As Isaiah said, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against your magic bands by which you hunt lives. There is birds, and I will tear them off your arms. I will let them go, even those who live, whom you hunt as birds. They're looking for prey, and they're using occult means to do it. The Lectio Divina, New Age Visualization, what John Piper practiced with Beth Moore, that is occult means. When a Christian gets saved, they completely renounce the occult. They don't continue doing it. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I'm against your magic bands. Verse 21, I will tear off your veils and deliver my people from your hands. They'll no longer be in your hands to be hunted. You will know that I am the Lord because you disheartened the righteous with falsehood when I did not cause him grief, but have encouraged the wicked. You've encouraged the wicked. What MacArthur does is wicked. What Rick Warren does is wicked. What John Piper does is wicked. What these people with this woman with these false visions, it's wicked. You've encouraged the wicked not to turn from his wicked way and preserve his life. You know, Peter was confronted by Paul in the presence of all. Why won't you people confront John MacArthur? I did. Tried to. But you closed ranks and defended him, despite the error with which he's seducing the people of God. No, this is not MacArthur derangement syndrome. Trump derangement syndrome was based on a lie. There was no Russian collusion. But MacArthur actually had satanic collusion. He teaches these things. Therefore, you women will no longer see false visions or practice divination. I will deliver my people out of your hand. Thus, you will know that I am the Lord. This game has been going on long enough. Women with visions deceiving the people of God. The game goes on long enough. Some of these people should know better. Others are just plain ignorant. Now look, no one has opposed hyper-charismatic extremism and ultra-pentecostalism more than I have. I've opposed the counterfeit revivals of Toronto, Pensacola. I've withstood people like Michael Brown the Kansas City false prophets, the word faith money preachers. On all of that, I say the same things as Todd Friel or Phil Johnson or John MacArthur or Chris Rosborough. But there's something else going on here. When all the true things they say and all the warnings they give, masquerade a deadly lie, a lie of Antichrist perpetrated against the body of Christ. It is outrageous what John MacArthur teaches. It is outrageous what Todd Friel defended concerning Rick Warren. It is outrageous what Jerry Falwell did. It is outrageous what J.D. Greer did. It is outrageous what John Piper did. It is outrageous. It is as much a deception as Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer, or Benny Hinn. Only it is better camouflaged. Because it's camouflaged with so many elements of truth. 
Justin Peters declaratively pontificates, slapping his hand, saying those who claim that there's any visions are going contrary to Hebrews chapter 1, he says. Well, of course, he entertained this woman who had the very kind of vision. He says that cannot be of God. That is what Justin Peter says Hebrews 1 means. Now let's see exegetically, rightly dividing the word of God, what Hebrews 1 really says and really means. Palomeros kai polotropos, pelejoteos, letesis tuis, patricin and tuis profitos. In many portions and in many matters, the old God talking actively to the fathers, meaning the avot, older generations, and in the prophets. This was written to Jewish believers, obviously. It was written to Jewish believers. I will look at it in Greek, but I will first look at what it says in English to keep things simple. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. The portions refer to the Perakashavua, the portions, the Palomeros, the portion of the week. It's known as the Haftorah, the ritual liturgical reading of the Hebrew scriptures in the temple and synagogue, carried on to this day. And in many modes, kai pelotropos. What the modes are is undefined. It doesn't specify that it was miracles. It doesn't specify it was revelations or prophecies. It could co-equally mean different modes of the text. For instance, different literary genre. In the Psalms, we have Hebrew poetry. In Zechariah, Daniel, we have apocalyptic. In Kings, we have history. In Genesis, we have narrative. We have Deuteronomic legislation in Deuteronomy. It could be many genre of the scriptures, of the portion of the week, of the reading of the law and the prophets. That's what it's talking about. Okay. Then it continues. Now, I want to read this. It is an adverb. Okay. Then there's a conjunction, kai, and, and then many, or many matters is also adverbial. An adverb of the old, and then it continues, the God, it's a nominative singular masculine, talking. It is aorist, active, nominative, singular, masculine. To the fathers. Dative, plural, masculine. Then the preposition, a n or in, tois, again, the, and then we have the prophets, perfites, which is dative, plural, masculine. God, in the old covenant, spoke through the Chav Torah, through the law and the prophets, through the portion of the week, the Parakash of Allah. That's what it says. That's all it says. Now, let's look at the next verse. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his son. We have a problem here that many Christians don't understand. I've explained before. It's the term eschaton. We think of eschatology, the last days, the close of the age. That is not accurate. The close of the age is the events preceding the coming of Jesus. The eschaton, so eschaton means latter, latter days. The former days of the old covenant, when God spoke to the Yavot, the latter days is the age of the church. We've been in the latter days since Pentecost. But because we don't want to be confused with the Mormon cult, we shy away from saying latter, we say last. 
But eschaton does not necessarily mean the close of the age. It simply means the age of the church, the present, as opposed to the old covenant age. Now, let me read this. Ep eschaton, those last ones, it's a genitive plural, female. Eon, genitive plural, of the Hemeron, of the days, totan, alelesin, speaks, uh, which is aorist, active, third person, singular. Uh, hemin, to us, and in huio, son, in whom or whom, hon, which is a uh, singular masculine pronoun, he places, as it were, uh, an allotment or a place. He places a place. Ephikin geronomon. This again is uh, indicative. Aorist active third person singular. And then Kironomon is accusative singular masculine. Okay. Panton of all genitive plural. Preposition through di ho whom kai and tos enyonos, the ages, or the, yeah, the, the, the ages he makes. Epoesin from, from the root poeon. He makes, okay? He hath in these last days spoken to us in his son. Now, the word for revelation does not occur in either verse 1 or verse 2. There's no apocalypsis. The word for writing is not in verse 2. The word graphos is not there. It is in the portion of the week in verse 1, but not as graphos. It is simply called palomeros. Okay, so you have writing in verse 1, not in verse 2. The word graphos is not there. Neither do you have the word for miraculous works, which is hormatai. It's not there. Those words are not even in the text. In his ignorance, in his utter and complete ignorance, Justin Peter teaches there was miracles, signs, and wonders. That's how God used to speak. Now he's spoken to us in the scripture. That's not what it's saying. It's all scripture. It is all scripture. Signs and wonders must always be judged in light of scripture to see if they're from God. But it's not saying he used to do miracles and revelations and the word apocalypse is not there. The word hamatai is not there. It simply says in the Old Covenant, he spoke to the fathers, the fathers of the Jews, through the portion of the week, through the half Torah, through the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, in the latter days, he's speaking to us believers, Jew and Gentile, through his son. That's all it's saying. Justin Peter says, no, the signs and wonders and miracles were for the old, and now the scriptures for the new. This is nonsense. It's not what it says. He's an ignorant, ignorant man. Now, it doesn't bother me he doesn't know Greek. It doesn't even bother me that he doesn't know how to rightly divide the word of God. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is he's a fraud and a charlatan who pretends he does. Ask Phil Johnson from Master's Seminary. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I have no problem with that. I have a niece who can speak Chinese. I have a daughter-in-law who can speak Chinese. I can't speak Mandarin. When I'm in China, I need a translator. I don't know the language. I can speak other languages, but not Mandarin. Doesn't mean I'm stupid. Doesn't mean Justin Peters is stupid. But don't pontificate. Make declarative, forceful pronouncements when you don't know what you're talking about. That is not what the text even says. 
Why does somebody who knows better, like Phil Johnson, let him get away with it? I don't know. Justin Peters has reached the point. I think of two leaders. King Saul and King David, both called and anointed by God. Saul got involved with a woman who practiced the occult. So did Justin Peters. In any event, when King Saul went off, Samuel approached him. And he tried to whitewash. He tried to cover up. When Samuel said, what is this bleeding of the sheep? Oh, I just tried to take what was good. He tried to justify what was wrong. And he wound up dead on Mount Gilboa, hanging on the walls of Bethshan. And those who followed him, knowing he was wrong, like his son Jonathan, wound up dead with him. Then there was David. David succeeded Saul, and David also made a terrible, terrible mistake with a woman. A terrible mistake. He was blind to the reality of what he did even morally. But when Nathan the prophet confronted him, he repented. Well, there was a price. There were ramifications of what he did. But it was put right. God blessed him, God restored him, God used him, God helped him. He didn't try to cover up. He didn't try to whitewash over it. I just wonder, is Justin Peter going to go the way of David or the way of Saul? Are those who follow Justin Peter going to go the way of David or the way of Jonathan. This is very sad. Being handicapped myself and having endorsed and recommended and advertised Justin Peter's ministry in the UK, I'm very sorry to say these things. But what he's done cannot be defended. Not only that, he is demonstrably ignorant of the word of God exegetically. He thinks passages mean things they don't. This is unfortunate. And so we have plastering over, whitewashing over. Can't you just say you got it wrong? Can't you just say MacArthur was wrong, is wrong? Can't you just say Rick Warren is wrong? Can't you just say John Piper is wrong? That Jerry Falwell was wrong? That Chris Rossboro and Justin Peters were wrong? No. They get the whitewash out. They plaster over it. They try to destroy those who should live because they're guilty of telling the truth in order to defend those who misled the people. God does not tolerate this. He didn't tolerate it in the days of Ezekiel. And he's not going to tolerate it now. The stage is being set for Antichrist. We must be aware. If possible, the elect will be deceived. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Satan used somebody nobody expected. So it was. So it is. I don't desire the destruction of these people. They've said many things I agree with. But I do desire their repentance. The Lord's not going to allow this to continue. He didn't allow it in Ezekiel 13. And he is not going to allow it now. Thank you so much for listening. 
Antichrist and cover up. My name is James Jacob Prash, Morial Ministries. God bless you. By the way, dear friends, as a very brief addendum, something that I didn't really see much need to address, but I will in case anyone is curious. Um, a number of years ago, there was somebody who had been associated with our ministry in South Africa, who we found out was teaching without our knowledge that God the Father is not the creator, that the blood of animals can take away sin and will do so in the millennium, that the gospel is not eternal, and then was teaching that we can pray the power of God into a tie or jacket and swing it and knock people over for healing, the Benny Hinn type thing. But we immediately got rid of this person. We got rid of them and said that we repudiate this. It's not our belief. We had to distance ourselves from this person. But those who supported him went on the warpath, and they produced a video by an organization called Catalyst in the UK. Catalyst. Now, if you were to go on the Catalyst website, you will see that they say that they are not Christian, that they have no beliefs, and that they will represent people of any faith, Muslims, Mormons, Hindus, and they do. They represent Hindus, Muslims, Mormons. They're not Christian. They are interfaith. They represent people of any religion, Buddhist, etc. And they also say that they represent people of any sexual orientation homosexual, lesbian, transgender, bisexual. So they represent people of other religions, even cults, Eastern religions, and people who are homosexuals and lesbians, bisexuals, and so forth. This is the Catalyst organization, according to their website. And the people who supported this person we got rid of had them produce a video against Moriel and against myself in which he made a series, a series of claims that could not possibly have been true. The first is that I was under investigation. Neither I nor Moriel were ever under any investigation in any jurisdiction. It's a complete lie. We were never investigated, not by the IRS, not by the police, not by any charities commission, not by any juridical body. We were never investigated. It's a complete malicious fabrication. Second thing he stated was that I was a cult leader who abused its members. Moriel does not have and has never had any members. I cannot be a cult leader who abuses members when there's no members. Again, more nonsense. I attend an ordinary evangelical church, and it's, it's just a church, and I'm not the pastor. We have churches affiliated with our ministry, but they're all autonomous and independent. Thirdly, he claimed that I profiteer from the sale of recorded material commercially. As everyone knows, you can go to our website for free video and audio downloads. It's free. We don't sell it. We give it away. How can I profiteer from something I give away? Another obvious lie, not just an obvious lie, something that could not even possibly be true. You can't profiteer from something you give away for free. Freely receive, freely give. I was never investigated, and we have no members. Uh, complete nonsense in a video produced by this catalyst organization, uh, by the supporters of somebody who says we have to pray into a jacket or a tie and swing it around to knock people over for healing and that God the Father is not the creator, et cetera, and various other things that are heretical. They were angry because we got rid of this person. And the organization itself represents homosexual, lesbians, bisexuals. It represents Muslims, Mormons, Hindus, Buddhists. That's this organization. To have Chris Rossboro Chris Roseboro, telling people, urging people on social media to go read what this ridiculous organization said about me a few years ago is absurd. It reflects the desperation to which he will resort, as well as his fundamental lack of Christian ethics. This is absurd. Again, it was hardly worth addressing, but in case there's any of our new viewers who encountered what he said, we just wanted to set the record straight.
Thank you so much for listening. God bless.